Uh, I'm Lawrence. I apologize for my coughing. Um, it's hard to control. I'll do my best. Um, I want to talk about BPF signing, what it means and what we might be doing about it. Um, most of you in the room will know that eBPF is powerful. We use it to build things like BPF trace. Um, it's still incomplete, yes. We're always adding. Um, with that power comes uh, potential for abuse. Uh, you can build, unfortunately, great exfiltration tools, key logging, so on. I think actually somebody has gone and done it and built a rootkit that uses eBPF in some fashion. And I think this, as a community, has always brought us up and said, uh, this is something that we do not want, right? This is bad for us because it um, creates negative um, negative view by outsiders. And I think it's also a shame that the work that we do would be abused for such purposes. <coughs> and of course, the problem is that to prevent abuse by necessity, we somehow have to limit what BPF can do. And obviously, that's a, uh, that's a big problem. And so we've kind of been going around this topic in various incarnations, I think, in some way, shape, or form. Like every conference is like one uh, talk that um, has this as a topic. So this time around, it's my turn. <coughs> and I want to uh, summarize a little bit the things that we've talked about in the past. Um, so I think way, way back when BPF started out, like any application could actually load a BPF socket filter, it could attach it to a socket it owned and kind of do useful stuff with that. And then Spectre happened. Uh, and the whole thing became a maintenance nightmare. Um, and uh, the solution to that was turn it off, which is, I think, in a way, it's pleasing uh, if only we could do that more often. So today, there's a syscall that um, says, you know, you know, is unprivileged uh, BPF enabled. And as far as I know, most uh, distributions today actually disable it. <coughs> um, the next thing we discussed was, well, um, BPF is guarded by Capsys admin. That seems kind of like a pretty big hammer. Can we do better? Um, Andre gave a really nice overview of the discussion that was going on, and we came up with Cap BPF. Um, but now it turns out that Cap BPF is not enough. We want to kind of solve this for user namespaces. What are we going to do? Here we go. BPF token seems like a nice solution. Um, we've also had, um, and I kind of I'm paraphrasing what what I think KP's intentions are. Um, KP, if you're here, please correct me if I'm wrong. Imagine you're um, an Android application. Uh, you're generally untrusted, um, but Google wants you to be able to load certain BPF programs that have been blessed in some way that are good because BPF is useful and allows you to do things that otherwise you wouldn't be able to do. Um, so KP has given a talk uh, or kind of, I think, even published an RFC patch set, which is like, let's sign a bytecode. Um, and kind of going even further, there are some companies that have requirements that say, well, anything that executes on a system should have some source of authorization. Uh, and I think Dave gave a really good overview of this as well. Um, I think Microsoft is kind of further along the curve on this than most companies, but I think that there are security conscious companies that are kind of coming to that conclusion as well. Let's, because this is about signing, my talk. What is the idea behind sign the bytecode? This is like very crude. Let's take the instructions that make up our, your program, hash it, sign that, <coughs> done. Um, this is not crypto advice, I want to tell you. Um, and of course, there's like many, many details here that I'm skipping that make this actually difficult to work out. Um, what I want to leave you with is kind of the reaction that I, as a de Cilium developer, have to this proposal. It would actually make our lives uh, extremely hard, I think. And the reason for this is this, which you might have seen. And I want to thank Anton for making this great slide. Uh, this is a diagram of the programs we have in Cilium and how they kind of call into each other. You, you notice I had to kind of angle it to fit it on the slide, um, which I think is very pleasing. So the the um, what I want to say is like signing BPF. If that was the only thing that was allowed, if that was like the the answer to saying, well, BPF can be abused and like we need to somehow protect against that, that would be really bad for projects like Cilium, but also other things that are really useful like BPF trace. <coughs> okay. So in uh, 
like the discussion we had, um, kind of Dave also gave the summary is, let's instead of signing the BPF program, let's establish that the program that is trying to do the BPF syscall is somehow trustworthy. And the goal that I had um, kind of with this talk is to show or to try out how, how difficult that is, how much, how far away are we from, from doing this essentially. And I think this is orthogonal to signed bytecode. If we really wanted to, we could do both. We could say, if the bytecode is signed or your program is trusted, then we allow this. Um, uh, so it doesn't have to be exclusive. Um, I wrote a little shopping list of the things that I'm going to need to um, build this. The first thing is to identify a binary. That's typically a hash of some sort. You need to prevent that file from being modified on disk. There's somehow a way to express trust. That's usually a signature. And then somehow I need to write a policy. Number one, I think I've heard it mentioned a couple times already. Um, uh, there's a system or, uh, called FS Verity. It's a fast um, per file uh, integrity mechanism that's really easy to enable, which is nice. And that gives you a hash and it also prov like essentially turns the file read only. Um, signatures, and I went looking around in the kernel and tried to see what was there and it actually turns out that IMA has a lot of the things that I, I wanted. Uh, one of them is like a signature format and a way to attach it to a file that's on disk, like in an extended attribute. It's like in kernel infrastructure for caching of stuff. Uh, very important, there's also like user space tooling um, you can run to fiddle with stuff and there's also like, they have some idea of key management, um, which I'll maybe we can talk about later. And there's some interesting integrations, apparently RPM supports this, which is new to me. And there's a project called Keylime, they kind of, the idea is they take all of this info that comes out of it and uh, tell you what is your system running, kind of different take on Tetragon, I guess. Something we could integrate as well. <coughs> Finally, I think this is the least surprising part. Uh, what's the policy gonna look like? It's a BPF LSM hook and some UK funks. Um, I'm gonna attempt the demo as well. Let's see how it goes. Shows up, yep. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do is run a lightweight virtual machine that has like a, uh, runs a patched uh, kernel. And that's that. Gonna do a little bit of setup. Some of this has to do with like how FS Verity works and uh, some of this has to do with how I kind of build the proof of concept slash the hack. So you need like an IMA policy to make it work, but something to be discussed. And then I can show you what are the kind of the, the parts that we need. There's like a certificate, a key that you can read. There's this create map thing, which is just as uh, yeah boring as it sounds, creates a map. Um, maybe I should have made it print something more interesting, I don't know. And then uh, we kind of have the gatekeeper program. And um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna first sign the Yeah, gatekeeper. like does it just create a map or actually pins it? Uh, it just creates a map. Okay. So it's like, uh, basically it's it's a placeholder for can I do a BPF syscall, essentially. So first I sign the gatekeeper. And then uh, the second stage is to put the gatekeeper into the background. And you can see, uh, okay, it's attached to the, the LSM program. You can already, there's like some debug output that says, okay, um, I'm actually allowing the gatekeeper access to the BPF. Um, so it's called, there's a great way to shoot yourself in the foot. In the beginning, I had a gatekeeper that didn't allow itself to execute uh, the BPF syscall, so that's kind of problematic. Um, but yeah, I guess this is the, the future that um, we might live in. Uh, I can try creating a map again. You can see um, like there's multiple things because it tries to do some magic. So there's multiple BPF syscalls behind the back, but um, you can see that it's denying access and the number four is just some enum that I'm printing out for debug. Um, how can we fix this? We can now assign the 
the create map binary. I can try again and voila, success. We can actually uh, execute BPF. What does it take to write this policy? Um, that's what it looks like. I had to do, I had to export two things, um, which is like uh, two functions that exist. It's the get task exe file and f put. Uh, and I wrote a new little k func, which is like this IMA file appraise thing. Um, uh, you might be thinking, okay, that I'm that new k func is kind of going to be 200 lines, but I think it's actually like something like 20 lines. Uh, and um, the experience of actually doing this was uh, incredible. Like using kfunks to add a new helper is really uh, fantastic. So thank you everybody who's who's been working on that. Um, kind of my takeaways are that it it why do you need works. F boot exactly? Sorry, F boot. <coughs> why do you need F put from BPF program? Yeah, uh, because the uh, why did I add it? I mean, is it a new k funk or mm. like what is I see? Okay. I mean, I just exported the helper. This is probably never going to fly, but this is a proof of concept, so I can do what I want, basically, which is nice. You can cut corners. Um, I mean, you could rewrite this somehow to say, you know, appraise the current task executable, or I don't know. There's ways around it. Um, my takeaways are it works, and it works with not too much changes. Um, I think the the what this identity this hash thing I used FS Verity, but I guess if, if this were ever to become a thing, we would have other things that kind of could provide this the hash and integrity. It could be DM Verity, something completely else. I don't know. Um, I think it's nice that the signatures are compatible with existing tooling because it's kind of a pain to come up with these systems and writing the tooling. Um, and finally, I think. It's kind of the obvious one, but that trust should be flexible. And I think that's also the kind of the biggest question I have. If this ever became a thing, like the way that keychains are managed is fairly strict for IMA, we would probably want to be able to say, well, kind of either we have our own keychains or have a way of saying, like, um, this kind of the second point that I have here is like the, the, the right now it's like an all or nothing thing. If if IMA trusts you, you you can execute the BPF syscall, but we probably need a, a much more granular way of saying, well, I only want a subset of signed programs or programs that have been signed by the specific key to be able to access it. Um, I don't exactly know how we would do that. Like one idea that I had when I, I was listening to Andre's talk is that we could tie something like a keychain to a BPF token. So we could say, if you have this token, then also um, the process uh, has to be signed by this key, something like that. Um, I think there's many interesting avenues. Uh, and the second thing is like for the proof of concept, I had to write like a little bit of IMA policy, which is not bad, but I guess it kind of begs the question of like how much integration would there be if ever we did this? Um, would we be allowed to just reuse the bits? <coughs> there we go, almost made it. Um, would we be allowed to just reuse the bits from the IMA infrastructure that we find useful or is it like a discussion to be had. Um, and that's really all I have. Um, and if anybody has questions, then please go ahead. I have. Yeah. I think like one piece that's missing and like it, it probably will require work in like tooling and libraries is some way to identify the specific uh, like workload, right? So like in your case, it's simple. You create the map, but like let's say you are running, like you're loading some BPF object file, right? It's not even one program. It's like a, each program is part of like the bigger whole. Mm -hmm. uh, so we probably need to have some way f like to instruct libpf, like go uh, BPF library to either do the digest from like the original L file and like provide that SHA as part of the BPF program load mm -hmm. or even allow applications to override this with whatever custom <coughs> Uh, identifier they want to provide and just like provide it as a, like a buffer of bytes, mm -hmm. stuff like this. So and like BP so well, for BPF trace, it will be different, but the similar concept, right? BPF trace might like normalize the script itself, mm -hmm. like maybe strip out like the white spaces or whatever, and then calculate the hash of that, or like maybe take the uh, IR tree, you know, st stuff like this. So like equivalent programs probably should have the same uh, checksum, but. 
So the way that this works, it actually doesn't look at what the program is that you're loading, right? It's completely oblivious to, you could be loading... E exactly, that's my point. Like, you can sign the BPF trace, but, like, you don't know what it is running. Exactly. And I think that that is kind of one... Th I'm proposing this from the model of this is probably what we would need for a Cilium to work, because it's so... But that's too permissive, right? So, like, BPF trace can run, like, any malicious script, so you probably want to make sure that BPF trace is trusted, and also, like, whatever script it's trying to run is is like validated. I mean, if you can figure out how to do that, I think that would be great. I'm, I, I don't know how I would do it, basically. Yeah, well, um, but that's what, what I'm saying. Like, like we can extend like with a very simple property, like on the proc load, where like loader, which mm -hmm. supposedly is trusted, yeah. can provide some opaque string, right? And then like whatever BPF LSM policy you have, like they, they can like check whether it's it's no in workload. Yeah, I think that maybe that's kind of the point I was making at the beginning, where this could. You could do this plus other stuff on top. Like you would say, oh, it has to be signed. Like you could say both have to be true, or you could say either has to be true. So just just maybe a question. I, I, I <coughs> am maybe not the best person to know, but um, at least the folks that I've talked to, I'm not sure you want the key on the node to sign, yes. right? Like BPF tool would have to have the key to sign, but nobody wants to have those keys on the nodes. Like they want those keys as far away as possible in a, like a box on some, you know, that's doing the, the, building the image. So that would, I think, has always been the trouble, the yes. hard part for this, right? Like, it's, it's because BPF tool wants to generate a program, it doesn't, nobody's, as far as I can tell, nobody wants to give that thing the key, because it's going to be running on the node. So, like, you're worried about the malicious code loading, but it has the key, <laughs> like, it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Th that's what I was saying. Th that, thanks, John, and this is the point I was trying to ask as well. Uh, VP, the key cannot be on the machine, right? Uh, it, it should be on the somewhere on the trusted build server. This is what establishes provenance of the signature. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so unless you give somebody rights to like do dynamic loading. So the gatekeeper needs to write a policy that these binaries uh, can, can load unsigned BPF programs uh, of the following type. That was that was sort of the thing I was, uh, I, I, th I thought it's still doable with this design, no? Um, I th think so. So I don't know, maybe I'm missing something. I'm not like security guy, right? But this is about identify workload. Like it's not about like signing or anything, right? Like I trust BPF trace to use like a blast algorithm, which could be just like a simple hash sum, right? And like I trust BPF trace to provide that identifier as a like kind of identifier of like what is the origin of the workload <coughs> I'm running. And then like you can have like pre-calculate the same hash on like 10 trusted BPF trace scripts and nothing else, right? Um, so if someone is trying to run like ad hoc script, that will fail. But if you run like the pre, uh, well, it's not even signing, right? It's like pre, pre calculated, pre blast scripts, then like it will let it through uh, by combining uh, trust in the BPF trace uh -huh. and then like knowing the workload ID. I, I think maybe this is a case of different, slightly different use cases. Um, I would, I would say that the model I'm like this, what the proof of concept uses, right? Then maybe we need a different one. I don't know, but it's more like trusting in, in a probably it's like saying I, I trust a group of people to do a good job and give me a binary that is as secure as it might be, right? So this might be for BPF trace. This is kind of applicable to Cilium, etc. And then you might have more. You might be saying, well, actually, that's not enough for me. I want to be able to vet the exact programs that go in, and you could have libbpf tools. You could statically combine your thing, turn it into a single binary that doesn't have any external dependencies, and you can still use this process to kind of say, well, these are the 10 libbpf tools scripts that I would like to be able to run on my infrastructure, right? You could still do that if you wanted to. Sorry, Dave. Yeah, so there's no. maybe two types of programs, right? Ones that may be pre-authored and could be sent off to a signing server to get signed by a key that's not online and whatever. Uh, BPF trace is generally not in that category, and there's ones that are dynamically constructed, and BPF trace is in that category. Uh, since you can't put the key on the machine in any secure fashion, you, you can't give that to BPF trace, then, you know, as we're saying, then you'd have to say, BPF trace can do unsigned programs. You can have a gatekeeper that says, for BPF trace, only allow programs that attach to the following hooks and call the following K funks and so on. So you can constrain it that way, but you can't constrain it to say which programs they are, but you can constrain maybe what operations, whether it's uh, program types or K funks or whatever else it has access to. You could write a gatekeeper program to do that to process the input, if you care about that. Um, the, 
Uh, other point that I was going to raise is not on uh, uh, Andre's point, but that was my response to Andre. Um, you say um, it, it, it works, but in, in great stuff, by the way. Um, please continue. Um, I didn't realize that Cilium was in the category of dynamic generation of code, more like BPF trace. You said it was really complex, right? Oh, yes. Um, uh, and so that means that the parts of it that work like BPF trace, in, in the talk that you referenced that I gave, um, there's a policy that says, if you want to do hypervisor protected code integrity, then you're disallowing the dynamic code and only allowing kind of the static code category, right? The one that right. you could actually sign in the data center or whatever, which means by policy you're saying BPF trace will fail, but that's because I've set a policy that, that is enforced by the hypervisor. When you set that policy, it means that there is a security distinction between code running in the kernel and what root can get. Okay? Meaning root can't get code running in the kernel because root can't get the code signed by the key that yeah. the hypervisor needs to list. So then there is a security distinction. Um, all of this that you talked about, even FS Verity and so on, I believe still relies on the assumption that there's no security distinction between those. And that's because uh, root can poke into the process that's been signed after it's been loaded and modify it or whatever. And if it can do that, then it can subvert and get code injected into the kernel even though it's been signed, right? So it still relies on an assumption that it actually will fail in uh, hypervisor protected code integrity. So when you say it works, it works as long as you don't flip that switch and turn sure. on such a security policy in your hypervisor. Yes, so I'm sure there's like, you're, you're much more versed in this, yeah. in this stuff than I am. So I'm sure there's like tons of holes in there, but. I think for like the m the mental model that I usually operate is like okay, if you, like you know executing the gatekeeper needs root. If you can do that, then okay, right. You can, you can modify the policy basically, right? You could switch it on or off. I mean, there's like in a way like the the way that IMA is designed is is I guess more of a of a thing where you you set a policy and you can never undo it, and maybe that's for the reasons that you that, yeah that you just mentioned. Think it works great. Uh, please continue. Uh, it's great stuff. Um, it won't solve the problem if you have uh, like the HVCI style of stuff turned on, mm -hmm. but for all the other cases, I think it's a great approach. Cool. Thank you. Uh, so Lauren, just a quick question regarding the signing key here. Like, where do you, just to clarify, this use case where we want to sign binaries on a trusted build server, yeah. uh, this would still work in this scenario, right? I don't need to have the private key on the host. No, you, you don't need it. It's just for for the sake of the demo. Like basically, this, okay. I just wanted to show it. The, the way it works is um, maybe I can scroll up. Yeah. So in the setup here, you can see this. Um, it says one key in keyring. Like the, it's kind of a little bit difficult to understand. But basically, what this does is runs it's like a binary called key cuttle or something, and that loads the 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 public key into a kernel keyring, and then that's what's used yeah. by IMA to kind of do its checks. So if, if, if I had shipped this kind of the, there's this IMA sign thing, that just ends up taking the hash and like calculating, doing a signature basically, but you could ship that out of band. You don't have to have that on your machine, right? You could imagine that it's, like I said, it's part of RPMs or you <laughs> bake it into the container image somehow, I don't know. Does that answer your cool. question? Yeah, it does, and it's, it's really cool. And this also gives the flexibility. If I want to use IMA or the implementation I had at some point where you could have the uh, the, the helper that was at the KPUNG that is already existing with the PKCS or PCKS number seven uh, yeah. styles, you, you, you can do that. Yeah, this is cool. Yeah, so are, we going to provide a, are we going to provide a reference implementation like based on IMA or... Sorry, can you say that again? Are we going to provide a reference implementation? Is there going to be like something that BPF tool is going to generate signed programs by default and the signature can be identified with a particular header and the kernel most like give a reference implementation for distros or some things to, to build on, right? That's yeah. that sort of stuff. Good question, I don't know. Um, that's basically what I'm here to, to ask about. Okay, uh, so. so I know this is kind of work in progress, but the signature seems kind of, I don't know, primitive. Like, do you, you just sign the main binary because you could easily like LD preload something or have a library that depends on that yeah. or something that gets replaced with something or? Yeah, you need to basically take additional precautions. You would have to kind of do things on top that say you can't actually execute other stuff, et cetera, et cetera. So like a statically linked uh, exactly. binary, blah, yes. blah, blah, yeah. yeah. All right. So it's like, I'm not saying like by doing this, everything is magically gonna turn out you know, super secure. Like even 
you know, full disclosure, Cilium ships Clang, right? Because we need to compile stuff. But I think if we have a system like this, we could work towards a future where we reduce the amount of kind of stuff we take in from the outside if this is something that, you know, actually people care about where customers come to us and say, we want to be able to have a version of Cilium that kind of has these properties, right? <laughs> What do you think would would it take to uh, be able to you know ship a Cilium container image where you then can lock down to say okay I want just a Cilium agent I want this to be uh, trusted in, in, in my trusted com com compute base but all the other potential applications that could be malicious or not they would not have the access like what like what would it take for us to be able to ship this with the image uh, like in this setup that you have? I, I think for me, the th like, mm, I can go to the shopping list. <laughs> mm, a bit too far. Okay. So um, I think this number, w for like, um, the Cilium being like a, a cloud native Kubernetes thing most of the time, like would be distributed as a container, I guess, and that's just a glorified tarball, I think. So I think the, like, Step number one would have to be find a way to add uh, signatures that we can make the kernel understand to this tarball. Like right now, there is a way, I think uh, we already do this for Tetragon, please correct me if I'm wrong, John. Like there's a thing called cosign where you can take a container, you sign that somehow. Um, but it's not clear to me how to make the kernel understand that. And I think it's, uh, I guess we could say, well, that's not involve the kernel as much. Like the, the proof of concept I built is like basically all of the logic for like deciding is this trusted or not, is this signature valid is kind of in the kernel. We could say like let's take it out and be a bit more lenient with that, then we could adopt something like cosine more easily. Um, but I think if we wanted to go with this approach where actually the kernel has like the the final say, we would have to figure out how to add these like FS Verity compatible or DM Verity compatible or something else compatible hashes to container images. I think that's for me like the biggest question mark. And then um, the number two is kind of the <coughs> bit, this trust and identity. And that's what I meant with this trust model thing. Like it's not clear to me how tightly we would want to integrate with kind of IMA and the system key ring uh, that exists, like there's all of these concepts that I'm not uh, well versed with, with we would have to answer, I think. Like if if you want to say like, what does it actually look like if you want to say, I trust the Cilium maintainers to produce a good binary, like how do you actually go about configuring that? Maybe as a as aside, um, about, since you're talking about trust of building the binary, I know folks have started to use Tetragon um, in their build process to get a, SBOM kind of thing from it, basically a trace of the build process, and then they hash that and use that as input to the thing. Um, you know, people have tried to do this with strace before, but strace was usually too noisy. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, it's usually not consistent enough. Yeah. I mean, maybe maybe people that maybe somebody might disagree with that statement. I'm not sure. Yeah. But um, you know, that would be, we could do yeah. that. I mean, we could we could. Tetragon, use Tetragon to monitor the syscalls and the connections and things for the build process. And then today we sign it with Cosign, which is a, has a secret key. I mean, we could sign it with something else, I suppose. Yeah. Can, can, can I take a stab at answering Daniel's question in a slightly, uh, because it was more particular towards having one trusted process that is Cilium in that container that wants to load BPF programs. What you could do then is have a policy that says that a a binary, only a binary that is signed with this particular private key is allowed to load BPF programs, right? You could, and load any BPF program effectively because that binary is then in your trusted compute base. Then you have, what you start off is, you build Cilium in a, in like a new container and sign the Cilium binary uh, uh, on, on the system. You have the verification key preloaded into the container kernel keychain, right? You ship the BPF program that like, enforces this policy, have it loaded as a part of systemd when the container starts. And then the at your BPF syscall, prog verify check, what happens is it checks who's 
uh, whenever you execute that binary, it sets a blob on your uh, on your task and keep, provides you the ability to uh, am I am I am I a signed binary that is allowed to load BPF programs? Then at the BPF says call time, you check that blob and you reject anything that doesn't. So in this use case, it is the it is the opposite side where you have just one part that is a part of the trusted compute place and is allowed to load uh, signed programs. So you don't need to sign the programs in this case. You just need to sign the binary that loads the programs because that's that's how, that's the thing you trust. And then you don't trust anybody else effectively there. Yeah, you could do that. I mean, I guess we're kind of bad for us if only Cilium was allowed to run. There's other stuff we do as well. So I think it's probably not like a future we want where we l like we use this to lock out. But I think uh, it's a realistic ask that at some point people are going to say we want to be able to control what you know who provides us a software that runs on our system. Yeah, then you can also think of. Then you can think about a loader spec as well, right? Like this is the the way you interact with the BPF con uh, like l control plane that is allowed that can do the BPF syscall. Sure. That is the vetted binary, and then you you interact with that binary uh, via whatever your favorite IPC mechanism. Yeah, or, I mean you could uh, you could use this to to have this yeah like a, a set of trusted programs that you can load in. You can talk to that daemon that's been signed via IPC, and then. Uh, do that way, I guess. Okay, I think I'm I'm out of time, anyways. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.